I just wanted to say one thing about Jane. She's a, a dear old friend, and she's one of the main reasons I believe revolutionary change is possible in America. And I keep saying that, and it's true. Um, <laughs> so Pete D'Amato is going to introduce Jane. Hey, everyone. Hi. Uh, sorry if I'm a little sweaty. I ran over from the wrong location. <laughs> um, so Jane McLeod's been fighting for uh, the being a voice for workers for over a decade now. Um, and she, uh, even if it's meant um, forcing some hard thinking within traditional labor, labor circles. Uh, born and raised in New York, uh, McAlevey has been mobilizing for the greater good since she was in high school, um, with one of her early victories including pressuring the trustees of SUNY to divest from s businesses in South Africa. Um, running contrary to a lot of the cynicism in the labor movement, um, McAlevey has been working to organize a stronger, more efficient, uh, more effective labor movement to benefit workers. Instead of l lamenting what's happening with labor in the country, McAlevey is looking at what we should be doing to move it forward. Um, not known to mince words, McAlevey has gone against many establishment labor voices to push what's best for the workers. Um, she was the director of the Stanford Organizing Project through the FLCIO, uh, which brought new thinking to a lot of the issues of organizing, um, what she termed deep organizing. Uh, which not only looks to, grow, to bring workers together on the job, but also to incorporate community organizing it as well. Um, her novel approach looked to address issues not usually central to labor organizing, such as affordable housing. Um, after leaving AFL-CIO, uh, McLevy went on to be director of the Nevada local in the SEIU Workers' Union, um, where she, in 2004, where she used her creativity and her hard-nosed tactics to really turn what was a shabby local into one of a n new model of labor organizing in the United States. Um, she recently published a book, Raising Expectations and Raising Hell, um, which shared the stories from her victories of the last decade of the labor movement. Um, she also contributes to New Labor Forum, as well as Alternet, um, and has been unapologetic about the rights of labor in this country. Um, so please welcome Jane McLeod. <laughs> Um, thanks very much. So my name is Jane McAlevey and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I have this on, I think, just because, so you all know, there's a recording device going that's so that this can be used for class and other things. Um, because certainly you won't, my voice will not be too timid for the room we have tonight. Um, so let me just uh, say a few things. I want to start by just letting you have a sense of what I want to do. Basically four parts to the talk tonight. I want to do welcome introductions. We're small enough that I want to do a quick round of just who you are. You're going to tell us your name. And, um, and then uh, we're going to break into little groups. I'm going to have you count off by four. Uh, and we're going to just do a quick exercise uh, to talk about social movements and some big events in it. And then uh, I'm going to give a little presentation, PowerPoint presentation, um, uh, with some of my evolving thinking about sort of, uh, the, I mean, Jeff just threw up the topic of revolutionary change. I'm like, all right, I'll go with that, sure. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give some ideas that are sort of couched from like 25 years of work in the field. Um, and that was a tremendous uh, introduction. And uh, I, uh, I spent about 10 years sort of full time, full time at like the 20 hour a day level uh, organizing workers in the labor movement. And before that, I spent about 10 years at the same pace organizing workers also, but organizing them in the environmental justice movement. Uh, mostly in the South, working at a place called the Highlander Center. So it's about 20, and then if you put the student stuff in there, it's like 25 years of just non-stop work in the field. I'm now breaking for a little while, uh, which is both for health reasons at one point, um, and just to pause to write more. Um, but I don't consider myself out or done or anything, but trying to evolve my thinking. Um, and I invite you all to participate in helping me evolve my thinking. And did you want, if you make the lights a little bit different now, I'm going to run through, it really is kind of, I'm throwing out sort of ideas at that level. Like I'm going to go through just a few handful of ideas and try and walk you through a theory of change in America. And I think we have to get back to a place that we were in before. That's great, I think. Uh, I'm going to try and get us back to it. I'm going to try and argue that we have to go back to a different kind of organizing in America that existed in large measure before 1970. Um, and I think the evidence for why we should be looking more at the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s in this country is because all that stuff we just talked about was won in that period. And if you try and think about what's been won since the early 1970s, uh, 
on a good day we could debate gay marriage, um, and after that there's not a whole lot, uh, from 1973 really until today. So that's a problem. So I say let's look at the time period when we were winning and un understand why we were winning. Um, so, um, oh we did move in jeopardy, all right, there you go. Uh, so I want to say that this is not a talk on Marxism. I'm in an NYU, I'm, I'm with some students in the house. Um, I've only recently become a student. You should just know from my personal bio, I dropped out of school at 17 and that's what I did. Um, and I began to organize. So uh, I actually just read Karl Marx for the first time two years ago because it's in the canon of sociology in which I'm now doing a, pro a PhD. So, and this is not talking about Marxism, but I do want to just reference Marx for a minute. So, you know, when we think of revolutionary change, uh, oftentimes, it's certainly in the US, we think of Marx. Um, when we think about Marx, we think about class and particularly the working class. Marx's theory of the proletariat kind of dominated the left in the US and elsewhere uh, for the last oh, 160 years or so. Um, also, this is not talking about Marxism, but we're talking about Brother Marx for a minute. And I just want to say there are no citations either, except those people are who I'm quoting. Um, uh, I am thinking a lot about Marx, Faber, Goldman, that's Emma, Dubois, Debs, Frary, Horton, and King, um, the Wobblies, the CIO, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SNCC, and the Environmental Justice Movement. Um, and then the re revolutionary movements in my lifetime. These are the things that have formed my thinking over the last 25 years. And the revolutionary movements in my lifetime that I had a role in participating in in very small ways, but exciting ways, which was the South African Liberation Movement with the uh, African National Congress, um, for whom I did a lot of jail time when I was still in school uh, before I dropped out. A um, lot of fun, taught me a lot about direct action and jail time and the meaning of militant protest. Um, and the FSLN in Nicaragua, uh, where I was working in the 1986, 87, 88 period. Um, and then I say workers in struggle. That's what I'm really citing because most of my experience comes from working with workers in America. And that's me uh, in a large, large negotiation session. That's what bargaining looked like in the union that I had the pleasure of leading when I did negotiations. We would often have hundreds and hundreds of workers uh, in tow uh, going at the boss. So that's obviously a caucus moment for the workers. We're planning and plotting what we're about to say to the boss. So Brother Marx on the proletariat. Um, I just, this is a little piece from the Communist Manifesto, just to remind us like where this idea forever in America and probably elsewhere that the workers, the sort of the labor metaphysic they call it, but that workers were the answer to the revolution. Right, somewhere from the uh, manifesto I take the quote, of all the classes that stand face to face with the bourgeoisie today, the proletariat alone, is a really revolutionary class. The other classes decay and finally disappear into the face of modern industry. The proletariat is its special and essential product, um, which is part of what Marx said 165 years ago. And just again, to go current, in my lifetime, uh, I grew up almost in a po po almost Marx Marxist, Marxist America. Um, you know, like I'm coming of age, you know, I don't have voting age till Reagan's second term. Some people were even born then, I'm guessing. But you know, so it's like it's we're, we've kind of seen that things didn't go as well as people would have hoped, maybe like back in 1848 under a different system. Uh, I'm totally skeptical. I went to the Soviet Union when it was still the Soviet Union as a very young person. I didn't like what I saw. I was coming of age during the Polish Solidarity Movement, um, and my basic uh, perspective on the world was that we had two major political economic systems, both of which were a giant colossal failure. Uh, to life on the planet and to the people who are on it uh, and all the species on it. And that would be hyper greedy capitalism as uh, issued in the United States <coughs> and communism as it expressed itself uh, in the Soviet Union. Another one of which I wouldn't want to live really under either system. I'd be fighting to change each of those systems. And so I live here, so I'm fighting to change this system. Um, so unions then. The contemporary face of worker struggle in the USA has been uh, unions, and we could have a long discussion. I'm hoping that that changes in America. I think there are all sorts of immigrant worker groups, worker centers. There's lots of formations, Slack. I mean, there's all sorts of groups and entities that make up a broader labor movement. But sort of the contemporary face of what we think of as worker struggle in the US has been unions, uh, historically. Um, so I'm going to argue that Marx is partly right about the role of workers, uh, partly, um, meaning that there is a special sort of revolutionary status uh, to workers. Um, in today's context, and I'm bracketing maybe always, because um, I'm doing a lot of history now, uh, I think his perspective was too narrow. It's certainly too narrow for contemporary times. Um, so I want to give uh, a few valuable lessons, I think, from unions, um, but I argue also from the civil rights movement. And part of that quiz you have 
I have different versions of that Jeopardy quiz that I do always, whenever I'm doing a training with worker leaders, I'm doing a training with whoever it is, you know, environmental leaders, I don't care. I feel like there's, our, we don't understand the history of our movements in this country. Um, and I'm trying desperately to help people think a lot about how we got to where we are because we can't get out of it if we don't understand it. So, but I am going to focus mostly on lessons that I've learned uh, from doing it, being a community organizer, running a lot of big local campaigns, you know, getting people out of office and in office, and then dedicating 10 years solid to just running what's called NLRB elections, mostly, National Relations Board, like old-fashioned union elections up against the boss. So the concept for Marx was the factory, right? That's sort of what, why the proletariat mattered to him. And I say, well, why? And if you read lots of Marx, which I finally have done, I'm sure people in this room have read more than me. Oh my God, I wouldn't even start that debate. So, um, but lots and lots of people, the concept of the factory was that lots and lots of people forced to come together and see each other almost every day building relationships. I'm breaking down Carl into like a few slides, by the way. Um, and the common enemy in the setting of the big factory was pretty apparent, right? Thousands of workers were going into these huge factories in the turn of the last century, and they rub up against each other, and they're getting less and less rights, and the conditions are horrible before any of the labor movements. There's horrible conditions. People are dying, and all the same stuff we're reading about in the Indonesian case that Dan talked about in Adidas factory, right? So we see what, how big factories move to other countries. But anyway, so the common enemy is really apparent when you're working in a giant factory and the conditions are horrible. It's like, there's someone responsible for my misery. And it's not that hard to see. That changes, though, as the U.S. evolves and we pass laws and who the oppressor is becomes a little more complicated. And to be blunt, you know, your boss sucks, right? I mean, that's what's happening when you work in a giant factory mm -hmm. ni circa 1930 in an auto factory before you have the UAW, right? And I, this is an important marker for me. You know, people think that the UAW, that, that auto workers' jobs, you think of them as these middle class jobs. I just watched this great documentary that had a lot of stuff about the UAW and the creation of the middle class. And, um, and what I like to remind people about, by the way, is that in 1930, 29, before the workers formed unions in the auto factories at record numbers in 1936 in this country, how good do you think it felt to be an auto worker going to work in an auto plant? About like being a home health care aide in America today, uh, but maybe differently satisfying, or being a McDonald's worker right now, right? The point is, what changed in the auto factories was workers coming together to form unions to change their conditions. So when we look around the country right now and people say, well, we have this horrible service sector, we have home, work at McDonald's, work in fast food, work in wherever you're working, a nursing home, whatever it is, um, people are like, well, that's back of the house jobs that are servicing banks in some town in Kansas City. It's like, oh, we have all these low wage service sector jobs that are so boring and, and mind numbing and uh, that's because we haven't unionized them yet, right? Jobs in the 1920s and 30s that became good jobs in this country stunk before workers decided to fight. So our job now is to do the same thing we did 100 years ago, which is for workers to rise up and begin to challenge the structures they're living under. So the foundation of change, um, I say, hinges uh, on one thing, which is social relationships among humans. Any Peter people in the crowd? Okay, good. Um, but to me, uh, the foundation of change, not just organizing, but change all over the world, hinges on social relationships between people. Big concept. Sort of simple, but I just want to ground us there. Why? Um, again, as Marx would use the word club up, we would use the word form organizations, form associations, people come together. Um, we need to, large numbers of people need to come together to overpower the oppressor, by the way, who always has more resources. And the oppressor for me is uh, the boss uh, of a big place who treats people horribly. Um, it's the landlord of a horrible public housing complex. It's you fill in the blank, right? But the, pe the 1%, I think I do this in the next thing, yeah, I mean, the, the, oppressed, the oppressed have one central resource through time, and that's our numbers. Uh, think 99% to 1%, right? Like the slogan of the Occupy movement of we are the 99%, like brings home the idea that the only thing that the oppressed have always had going for us against the very super powerful elite all through time is our numbers, because there's way more of us than them but they control money, militaries, resources, guns, whatever you want. Right now in America, they control giant coffers that donate to political campaigns, right? So they've always got more resources than we have. What we have is human capacity. So can we realize it? When we do, we have victories of the scale that are on that quiz that we started out with. When we can't realize it and we're divided and we're not doing our work right, we're getting our asses kicked. That's like 1973 to 2013, last I looked, basically. Um, so. Why do most people take action? 
And again, I'm just running through some concepts. Like this is all stuff where I would be footnoting this heavily, but I'm just saying it because I learned it to be true, and apparently it's in a lot of books too. Um, most people take action in America um, because someone they know asked them or invited them. That's the most simple answer. It's not because a canvasser showed up on their door and handed them a flyer. It's not a cold phone call on the phone to someone you don't know saying we're having a big action, would you come? Uh, it's not from a call to someone you don't know, that's a key word. Uh, it's not a flyer on the street, even though I'm glad Dan's <laughs> leafleting, but Dan already knows us, we know Dan's, we should all go to his action. Um, it's not a press release, it's not a tweet, it's not any of those things. Um, that's not why people go to things. Or we'd have, how many people here tonight, Chuck? 3,000, right? Right? So people come to things when someone they know asks them. That's the basic rule of recruitment into movements in this country across every movement. Um, and who is the best someone to ask someone to take action? It's someone we trust. These are things we've learned over and over and over when you're out in the field doing organizing work, right? So the best someone to ask you to get you to actually come. So if I walk up to Pete, and I have never met Pete, and I say the most important thing in the world is happening down the street, you gotta come. He's gonna be like, ever check, right? But if like, I know Pete a little bit, and I call Pete and say, man, there's a struggle going on down the street, it's super important, I know you got things to do tonight, but you gotta come. It's like, the idea that Pete's gonna answer that question differently uh, is pretty overwhelming um, in literature, but also in real life. So I'm just gonna take you through some ideas here. Um, so it's someone we trust. Um, and what's trust based on? Trust is the key lexicon. So if social relationships matter to social change, recruitment and why people take direct action in America relates directly to someone that they know. Who's the best someone? Someone who you trust. What's the foundation of trust? Someone who's reliable, honest, ethical, right? You can all figure this out in your own head, like why you would trust someone. So I'm going back to the big factory and social relationships. Secondly, I would posit here that most people, how do most people learn best? If I ask you that question, how do you think most people learn the best? By doing. By doing. Right? Not by reading books. There's a little 1% of the elite. We're sitting here at NYU and a bunch of universities. We read. Most people aren't sitting around reading, right? So they learn by taking action. They learn by doing. Um, so by taking action, and I say in struggle, um, why? Uh, <laughs> really basic concept here, but <coughs> no one likes to be told anything. Do you like to be told anything? Like, do you like it if someone walks up to you and says, uh, uh, capitalism stinks because everyone's oppressed? That doesn't, that's not going to go over really well in most of America, by the way, right? And, and if you, someone says to you, you're oppressed, I've watched organi young organizers do this with workers, by the way. Ah, fire! No, okay, we try and reform them, and then they have to go do a different job. But anyway, <laughs> no one wants to be told something, right? You want to come to your own decisions about things. You want to learn things on your own. Self-awareness is like the best way you're going to learn, which is why we put people into struggle, so that they learn things. So especially in the U.S., I say we're sort of the cult of individualism is sort of like the ruling narrative in this country. It's repeated daily in every medium possible, all the time, everywhere. It's all about individuals. So if our culture is about individualism, you can't really walk down the street and say, you should protest against the political repression of the Koch brothers in Wisconsin because they're horrible and they're oppressing you and your family. That's not actually gonna work, right? So people actually need to come to the realization themselves about what's wrong with many things around them. Each person has to learn about the oppressor and oppression from experiencing oppression. That's the basic thing I'm positing here. So, uh, there's some concepts I'm playing with right now about the ratio of repression to action, because uh, there is a relationship in this, this is all coming back to sort of why, what we can learn from unions in America uh, in really profound ways. Um, the more opposition uh, people learn to beat, meaning that you learn to overcome, the sort of greater the muscle that you're growing is. So if you go out and you say, uh, I'm going to take a street corner. We're just going to sit down and take a street corner. Uh, and you pick a really bad street corner, like well, I would say the far Rockaways, because no one can even get there anymore. Um, and you don't disrupt anything and nothing really happens and no, one's actually, no one actually comes to either tell you to clear the street. Even if you have 300 people on an empty street, it doesn't really matter. right? Opposition and repression tests movements. Can you overcome, in the case of a workplace campaign with workers, can you overcome uh, a bunch of workers are together and uh, they put on a union button and a bunch of them get fired instantly? That's a form of intense repression which goes on in America every single day 
and most people don't realize the extent to which you put on a union button, you get fired. Um, I spent my time not in New York. If you're in New York, you'll be particularly not understanding this. But in most of America, uh, go out into the middle states, the red states, the vast majority of states, and it happens here too, by the way, as people in this room probably know. But it really happens in great numbers outside of sort of California, New York, Washington, Connecticut. You know, just go down south, put on a button, um, and you will be fired. That's a form of repression. So um, when, we're, when people learn to overcome that kind of repression, they're building a stronger muscle for the next fight they're going to engage in. And these concepts of leadership, how we build our movement stronger, um, super important. Uh, and I say within reason, because a absolute repression, by the way, you're not overcoming. So when the military comes out and guns you all down, that's actually not really, that's not a, <laughs> that's not a good lesson about repression. You're just going to get gunned down. We've got plenty of examples of this all over the world right now. So in some ways, sort of like liberal states, you know, like America, Western Europe, et cetera, any place where people have some basic rights is fervent for a lot of testing of movements, of building your muscles, of trying things, of getting repressed, you know, uh, and again, the civil rights, well, we'll come back to that now. Um, so now I'm just going to cut to the chase a little bit. Those are concepts. Now I'm going to go to some examples, lessons from private sector union organizing in America. And I have little pictures scattered throughout that are just from different struggle moments um, with workers that I've had a lot of fun with. Um, th this shot is some, from something I call the Filipino Revolution when we were in Nevada, um, with tons of Filipino nurses are being brought in on open windows the healthcare sector. I spent most of the last, no, I spent the entire decade, uh, and then there's five before that, but a decade doing hospital and healthcare organizing mostly. Um, and by way back to the big factory concept, some of the only, the, the sort of analogy to the big factory that's left in America right now, because we don't have many of them, they've been shipped somewhere else under a paradigm of trade rules, right? We just took big factories out of this country. So large workplaces in America can be a school, can be a university, definitely can be a hospital. I'm talking about places where there'd be a thousand or more workers who punch the clock and come to work all the time, right? So I um, was playing with hospitals, mostly pretty big facilities, thousands of workers. And um, the closest we get to sort of the modern factory, but I want to put a caveat on that because in our new economy, what's different about a big hospital, even though it's a big setting, is that when you strike or pull the switch or pull the lever, you don't just shut down a factory line. You've got thousands of patients in a hospital. Well, that's a whole other discussion, putting out that for a different day, right? The changes and the implications of the changing economy and our tactics in it. So, um, but these workers, um, part of what they're doing in hospitals in America is they are flying in tons of international workers, mostly from the Philippines, on special guest visas. Um, because a lot of these workers believe they have no rights when they come here, even though they do. Uh, and this is an example of just good organizing work that we were engaged in in Nevada. Uh, we were heading into the first strike in the history of a hospital in the state of Nevada, um, which we won uh, after a lot of struggle. And uh, all the white nurses would say, and all the racism, and the boss would use the Filipinas against the white nurses, right? This is America. For God's sakes, we play racism every day to divide the working class. So. Uh, there was this whole theory by a lot of the white nurses that the Filipinos wouldn't do it. They actually wouldn't strike because they'd be too scared. Uh, and in the end, uh, it's the Filipinos who really led the strike, by the way, um, under the threat of not just being fired but being deported and losing their H-1 visa status. So it's a wild, interesting story, again, about what organizing is, what trust is. Two of the biggest leaders in the Filipino community were nurses or in that picture and like literally led waves of Filipinos down to vote yes to strike. Uh, and then led them out um, on the first day of the strike against the imagination of most uh, of the staff and most of the white nurses. So uh, very interesting. Um, and what Filipinas brought, what their sense of struggle also brought to the US you know, in terms of immigration politics, fascinating. So the fundamental difference with unions. This is a fundamental difference between unions and all other organizing going on in America right now. There's several things. One is that when you're doing union organizing, you are dealing with a cross-section of America. Meaning, if I'm campaigning uh, for USAS to come to them to the Adidas rally, or if I'm campaigning for an environmental law, or if I'm campaigning for gay rights, or if I'm campaigning for fill in the blank, women's issues of choice, anything, who comes to the meeting, if we're successful at mobilizing, who comes to the meeting are people who are interested in the issue. So you get people who show up who have a pre they're, they're already interested in what you're working on. That's why they come to the meeting. In union organizing, it's totally not the case. The boss, some, some boss, hires all the workers. In the case of a hospital, 2,000 workers get hired by a boss. It's just 2,000 workers. 
who are Republicans, Democrats, right to life, gun owners, dog lovers, dog haters, right? It's a cross-section of America. It's not self-selected, I'm for the environmental movement, so I'm showing up at your meeting. It's 2,000 Americans, red state, different opinions, don't like each other, do like each other, racist, not racist, right? If I'm doing a meeting on fighting back an affirmative action plan or something, who's coming are people who already believe in that. So when you're doing union organizing, you're dealing with people who don't in any way start out sharing your values, which is a fundamentally different kind of organization in this country. It's just a bunch of Americans hired by a boss. So that's the first difference and it's fundamental. Um, it's about why we get to scale, I'm going to come to it in a minute. And then the second is in private sector, and I wrote private sector because it's a slightly different thing when you're doing governmental workers. In the private sector in America, the workers have to, have to carry all the work of the campaign. And I'm going to distinguish that between almost every other organization in this country again. Um, why? Um, there's this thing called trespass laws, cops, police, etc. I put on the bottom of that slide. Uh, you know, if I, Jay McLean, the organizer, come near the hospital that these women worked in, which is called Valley Hospital um, in downtown Las Vegas, if I stepped my foot on the property of the parking lot, I'd be arrested. If I tried to walk in the hospital, I'd be arrested. Because in America, in a private sector hospital fight, the staff get a you, you have no rights. The boss can just say, I'm going to arrest that person. They're not invited onto the property. So what's different is, in most of the advocacy work we do in this country, environmental movement, women's movement, all these things, um, first of all, people come because they're already interested, so you don't have to really persuade them. You don't have to change their mind. They're with you on the issue when they show up at your door for a meeting. In a union, that's not the case. They are not with you when the boss hires them. And the second concept is, in a tough campaign in a private sector facility like a hospital in Nevada, I can meet with workers off work and talk to them and help them get history lessons about what tactics are going to work to carry their campaign. But I, as the staff organizer, cannot at all walk into that hospital and carry on a direct action against the employer. It's got to be done by the workers themselves. They have to have the confidence and the skill to carry off major actions inside the workplace. Two concepts that make union organizing in the private sector fundamentally different than any other kind of organizing in this country. And it's part of what makes it valuable and strong. So the role of staff in union organizing is to identify what's called the organic leader uh, among the workers. Um, and I gave a clue to that earlier when I talked about Cesar Chavez, right, and Fred Ross Sr. And Rosa Parks, and who would her leader be? Guy named Martin Luther King. Um, Rosa Parks went to a place called the Highlander Center where I used to work to get trained. Uh, Cesar Chavez was trained by someone named Fred Ross, who was an organizer. So the role of the organizer in movements is to identify organic leaders among workers. That's like a three-day training, but I want to just posit the idea. Because who the organic leader is, all people are not equal. Not all people persuade people equally. That's just true. It's just a truism. Some people are not going to persuade some people to come to something. I went back to trust. You have to know someone, you have to trust them, what's trust based on, ethics, morals, all sorts of things. In a, in a hospital campaign, like the hospital campaigns I ran, a key way to identify, almost guaranteed, who the organic leader was on each shift in each unit in a big hospital is by simply getting to the bottom of one question. And organizers miss it all the time. I'd say to young organizers, so who's the leader on the third shift in the post anesthesia recovering unit? And they'd say, you know, we're doing an organizing campaign, and they'd say, well, Sally. And I'd say, well, tell me why is Sally the leader? And they'd say, well, Sally came right down and grabbed a bunch of union cards and went right back upstairs with them. So that makes Sally the leader, because she's for the union, and she's going to go do some work. Um, and that organizer wouldn't win a single campaign, because Sally, just because she's pro-union, may not lead anyone in her shift in her department. She's not an organic leader. The organic leader in that work site would be the worker that most workers trusted. That's the simple answer to the question. Most workers have to trust the leader on their shift in their, in their department. And it may not be someone who's pro-union at all. The organic leader on a shift in a unit might be anti-union at the start of the campaign. And if we can't, and her coworkers can't flip her perspective, because she is the actual organic leader of the workers in that unit, meaning that's who they all turn to and that's who they trust. If we can't recruit, my job, if I can't recruit the organic leaders to the cause of the union, we're not winning the campaign. Simple. Over. End of discussion. So the concept of leader ID is basically what I'm really writing um, a new book about. This is the central question. To me, the most fundamental question about what happened after 1973 in America is we gave up doing 
development of leaders in this country, and we became a staff-heavy, staff-driven movement. And we will never be able to win in a country as big as America if we rely on paid staff to go recruit people, as opposed to identifying people who lead people across America and helping train them in the tactics of the oppressor and the opposition. Um, so identifying the organic leader is the role of the staff. We lead, we find the organic leaders. There's a whole series of questions that we have to ask in ways we do it. And then our job, my job, is to teach the leaders how to go inside in their hospital, in their factory, and carry on the fight, because I'm going to be arrested if I go there. And if we haven't done our job right, we fail. So there's a very important role of staff, but there's an even more important role of the workers inside the facility. Neither one, there's a lot of romantic debates in this country about you know, staff, movement, blah, rank and file. It takes both to run a big campaign in this country right now. Um, so the organic leaders then are the ones who teach the large numbers of workers in the facility. They have to go carry their shift, their department, their unit, their everything. Uh, and there is no other organizational form doing that in the USA right now. So scale, and I probably have about like six more minutes of this talking and then we're going to stop and do Q&A and chat. So scale, concept of scale. How do we get as big as we were in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s in America? I'm going to keep going back to the opening quiz because in those days, we understood these concepts better. Our whole movement did, and we just don't anymore. So scale, how do we get big enough to beat the kind of forces that are like winning everything in America right now, the Tea Party and crazy factions and the corporations who are funding the Tea Party? Um, so that we're down to the point where there's 7% of private sector workers have a union, right? Like we're losing right now in America. Everything is going backwards in our country. Um, so scale. Um, I say the best unionizing can actually get to scale faster for several reasons. Because people come together every day in a large facility. We can actually identify the organic leaders faster in any place where they come together, I'm going to argue. Uh, but for the moment, in a union campaign, because the workers come together five days a week, four days a week, six days a week. They know each other. I can ask every single person there, who would you turn to if you didn't know how to put, uh, 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 if you didn't know how to do a procedure on someone's arm? The simple answer to that question is who the leader is. When 15 workers out of 20 tell me that they turn to Mary, because Mary knows how to do the procedure best, Mary's the leader. And Mary might be hating unions. And if we don't flip her again, concept, if we don't flip Mary, we're losing, right? So it's not who likes the union on day one. That's not going to win us a union campaign. Um, uh, because they come together all the time, we can test them faster, meaning we can run actual tests. We can say, how many members can you go get to join? How many people will put a sticker on today? You can start to test the leaders very quickly. Are they actually leading people? If they're not really leading people, you're not going to win the campaign. Um, we have access to them because we see them all the time, so we can teach them faster. Um, and it allows us to replicate the movement, right? So then we teach them skills of what they need to do to have a successful sticker up or a button up where they'll put buttons on. Do not think you just say, oh, we're going to button up today and buttons go on thousands of workers. Crazy. Crazy. You got to bet like a year of work to get to like maybe a half a year of work to get to like where you have a successful day where 90% of workers in a multi-thousand facility put on a sticker on the same day. And you got to have the leaders identified and you have to assess them and test them, etc to get to scale. So I want to note also that the civil rights movement had scale. Um, and they had the same theories, but what they had was the black church. And the black church functioned a lot of the same way uh, as a factory did, meaning large numbers of people from a cross section of society, in this case black, but came together that they weren't predisposed to be for one thing or another. They were just people who came into a large black church somewhere in the south, mostly. Um, and they were different economic strata. They're mostly poor and mostly working class. Um, but they began to bond through the same structure that they came to week after week after week. It's similar in some ways, I think, to a workplace. Um, and their oppressor is pretty clear. Jim Crow, white people, is like the boss. Similar concepts, right? Their oppression was pretty clear. Who was doing it, the source of it, pretty clear. So you make a lot of parallels between the very excellent organizing in the civil rights movement and very excellent organizing in the labor movement. Each of them relied on identifying the organic leaders. There's a book by Charles Payne called I've Got the Light of Freedom. If you want to read an amazing book, the most amazing book I've ever read on the US civil rights movement I'd never heard of until, oh my god, I started graduate school. What a terrible thing to say. But I didn't read a lot except the New York Times. So um, I'm, re I'm making up for 25 years of being in the field and not reading. But Charles Payne, I've Got the Light of Freedom, uh, lays out in several hundred beautiful pages the theory of identifying organic leaders all through the South, like a Rosa Parks. Um, so uh, literally, it's like the book I'm going to cite the most in my own little PhD. Um, 
So, uh, and their movement, interestingly, as a challenge to the Marxists, I like to say, was not a workplace-based movement, right? It was not based in the workplace. It was based somewhere else. And they had revolutionary change and revolutionary struggle in this country. So it goes back to scale, <coughs> organic leaders, replication, repression, how you overcome repression, how many times you have to do it, how big your muscle has grown until you get to big change. Mobilizing versus organizing, now we're wrapping up. These are the concepts I'm trying to build to. Uh, that there's a difference, in my opinion, very strongly, between the concept of mobilizing and the concept of organizing. And in America, in my experience, people mix up these terms all the time. Let's go organize these people, let's go mobilize them, let's go mo let's mobilize and organizing. Um, they're really different concepts. Uh, and the difference is I'm, I'm going to sum up really quickly for you on this little chart. No, I'll it once. Okay. So um, in mobilizing, uh, I say the people are already with you. Your job is just to get them off the couch down to an action. That's what mobilizing is. They're already with us. That's what 99% of organizations in America do right now. We're mobilizing people who are already on our side when we give them the flyer to come to a meeting. They're with us already. We're just teaching them, which is hard. By the way, it's hard work. We're just having a more effective way to get them out to do direct actions or actions or protests or voting or whatever it is, right? But they believe already in the forces of good versus the forces of evil in the same view that we broadly have. Um, but in organizing, the concept is expanding our base. Uh, so the contrast here is they're already with us, and in here, the concept of organizing is about expanding the base of people united with us in the idea of the 99% to rise up against the 1%. Fundamentally different concept. So like a union, that's why I laid out the description where I said the boss hires them, they come as Republicans, they come as gun owners, they come as uh, right to lifers, they come as in favor of killing small seals off ships and whatever it is, right? They don't come as people with progressive ideas. They just come as workers who have all sorts of opinions. So our job, I think, in the country is to get back to bringing more people who are unconvinced into our movement. That's what I'm calling base expansion. Mostly since the 1970s, we're doing mobilizing, which is not expanding our base. And it's why 40 years later, we're getting our asses kicked in elections, in the streets, in state houses, all over this country. Um, so back to the contrast, uh, mobilizing. Uh, Post-1970s, our, mo our model turns into a mobilizing model in America, away from the organizing done in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, <clears throat> we now have advocacy groups or special interest groups. Um, and those groups are characterized by professional staff. We have a lot of groups with a lot of staff in America now, from either foundation funding or in the labor case, from workers funding them through their employer. Um, but it's a lot of staff mobilizing a lot of people to come to things. And it's not working. And we have 40 years of evidence that it's not working. Um, by contrast, organizing work, which doesn't have to be a union, but I use the private sector union campaign to give you an example, the best example, I think. Um, the grassroots leaders actually have to do the work themselves. And yes, it requires some staff. It requires some people who know history, the history of movements, the history of change. But it's fundamentally not a staff role. It's grassroots people themselves taking action, um, learning uh, the lessons of history of how we got to places. Um, back to mobilizing, um, again, who comes to it are the issues um, attract people. So they're pre-selected, they come, they're already kind of on our side. Organizing, um, the people involved are, well, everyone. The boss hires the workers, the parishioner attracts the members, the landlord contracts to a tenant. It's just different, it's just people. Um, uh, and fundamentally, mobilizing doesn't grow our base fast enough. It's not growing our base fast enough. The right wing is outpacing us in America. Um, and in organizing, uh, expands the base of who is with us, who we then have to mobilize more effectively. But our movement's gotten good at mobilizing. Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, tweets, all that stuff. It's like, that's all mobilizing. Um, but yeah, we got to do much more of base expansion. How do we persuade and help ordinary Americans understand the forces that are oppressing them? Very different challenge. Um, so is it just the workplace? Last two slides. This is going back to the opening slide about Karl Marx. Um, I don't think it is just the workplace. It's not my experience. So other arenas include places where large numbers of mostly people of the same economic status come together. And in America, that is especially not big factories anymore because they don't have big factories. So we ought to be looking for other places where large numbers of mostly the same economic status come together. Um, uh, anywhere the oppressed congregate 
uh, and relate in large numbers. That can be churches, temples, mosques, whatever it is. That can be public housing complexes. That can be public schools. That can be segregated hoods, meaning huge segregated neighborhoods all over America where just like similar people are segregated by force of development patterns. Um, there are a lot of places that are not just the workplace where regular experience and relationship building happens among oppressed people. Uh, and the final concept, uh, work in Stanford, live in Stanford, this is from a protest uh, with the daughter of a worker. I had the pleasure of organizing her mother in a nursing home. Behind her is her mother and her minister. Um, and this is from a protest we did where we took the fight a union fight from being a fight simply about workers' wages to a fight about workers' wages, workers' rights, and about affordable housing in a very unaffordable place. Um, and by doing it the way we did it, suddenly we were not just mobilizing uh, one worker, but we were mobilizing her entire family, her congregation, her church as the union. Um, and this is sort of the final concept of trying to marry it. So um, whole worker organizing is the term I've given that I wrote about a lot in the book that just came out. Um, that's sort of, I think, kind of a fun read. It's not heavy anything, unlike the dissertation will be. Um, but whole worker organizing is sort of the theory. Um, and I'm sort of challenging the concept that workers are only revolutionary in the workplace. And if we rely on that theory, we're dead in America because we don't have big workplaces. So um, it is based on organizing theory, not mobilizing, meaning one-on-one, -on -one, face to face recruitment, <coughs> who you trust, all the stuff I went through. Breaks down the walls between workplace and non-workplace fundamentally just erases it. Forget it. You can't tell me that if you can get thrown out of your housing, that's any more or less important than getting a dollar, two dollar an hour raise. It's not. And that's the conditions that we found in the fight that we took up in Connecticut. Um, we see the worker as a whole person under this model. We place equal weight on workplace and non-workplace issues affecting the worker themselves. We don't bifurcate. <clears throat> I think there's a lot of gender, actually, <coughs> by the way. Uh, the way that we say that in America, we say that union organizing is so important, community organizing isn't. That's sort of a debate in the movement. I think there's a lot of gender attached to that, by the way, because like work matters. Men used to go to work, and women do housework and homework, and that's their concern, like schools and housing. And it's a whole other <coughs> layer of gender, which we could come to when we have a five-day discussion. Um, whole worker organizing, uh, I largely think it maximizes the additional places of struggle and learning where we can put people into struggle so that workers and their families and their neighbors can see how the boss in the third shift is relating to the mayor who closed the school and who's relating to the landlord who doesn't fix the house and never charges their rent. For people to understand a system of oppression, it isn't just the boss in the third shift. They have to understand how all of these forces relate together to oppress them. Um, we have to connect the dots uh, of the system. And that uh, is just a backyard meeting. You see one purple shirt. This was SAU at the time, but like, you know, we have one organizer there, and we had one organizer there, and that was a ton of tenants in a housing complex, the housing complex they lived in, coming together for the first backyard meeting to save their housing, because they were all going to be evicted from it, 168 units of housing that mostly workers lived in. But as the union, we took up that fight, and we taught the tenants how to lead their fight, and they saved their housing. But the union skilled up the fight in the beginning. And then we just walked away and like they already knew how to fight because we had trained them how to fight at work. Um, so workplaces in today are not huge factories. I had hospitals as a good lab. They're kind of big still. Um, uh, the boss in the same big place can be, uh, right now in America, even in a hospital, you know, you go to, like workers go to a, a hospital, you can have eight different bosses. We subcontract out like Sodexco, right? Like the people who cook the food in the kitchen is different than the people who do the cleaning and all that stuff. You know, people don't even know who their boss is in America, so I'm arguing for a different model. The informal economy is growing. Um, service work is really different than factory work. Mission-driven, caring work, right? If you pull the lever again, if you're striking a hospital versus striking a factory, pretty different uh, outcome. And then ending on the same uh, brother, just for fun, who I started on, which is Marx. Um, back to his old manifesto. Uh, uh, Free men and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman in a word, oppressor and oppressed stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on and uninterrupted, now hidden, now open, etc. I even think that in Marx's own language, there's a lot of language about simply getting to the oppressor and the oppressed. Um, and I think it's not just in the workplace, but we have tremendous lessons from the workplace in America, from private sector union organizing. That's it. Stand up, stand up, just stand up in your place for a minute, just stand up, shake your arms and legs. Ah.
Okay, great. Sit back down. Thanks. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's what I'm thinking about. Cool. Any questions? Comments? Uh, you get in trouble <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With who? Almost everyone. Yeah, who? who? That's good. That's a good question. Well, when I was doing union organizing with a lot of bosses and sometimes a lot of labor leaders, mm -hmm. people who are stayed in a tradition uh, that is very much focused on sort of an older notion um, of a union being something that only works on wages and working conditions at work. Uh, so I was often inside the labor movement in a very, I'm in very contentious battles about this question of the role of the union and what the union is. But mostly I get in a lot of trouble by, you know, with police officers and uh, bosses and okay. um, people like that. And mostly I'm trying to help thousands of other people not get in big trouble uh, or get it in big trouble together. The whole idea of organizing is, right, when 3,000 workers successfully, actually, all at once in the same shift put on a button together, the boss can't fire 3,000 of them. Uh, but when 10 put them on and go to work, they're going to get fired. Mm -hmm. And bad union organizing allows 10 workers to put a button on, and good union organizing, everyone has enough discipline because the organic leaders are leading the workers themselves and saying, we're not putting on a button today. We have to wait. We're not strong enough yet, right? Mm -hmm. So there's concepts. But yeah, lots of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can judge trouble all different ways. Um, okay. You know, being in battles with sometimes labor leaders or being in jail, I don't know, about 45 times. But yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in, um, I'd love if you could maybe tell us a little bit about an experience of an organic leader who perhaps ideologically isn't positioned in favor of a union, who's like, you know, I think, I mean, I'm just really interested in that because I know that sometimes when I've done organizing, it's like the instinct is just to find that person who's like the beardy lefty, you know, <laughs> just like, hey, there they are, they read all their marks, say. and then you realize that they actually alienate quite a lot of the... Ding, 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 ding. So, so I'd love to just know what actually it looks like to find that person and, and like then try sure. and have the conversation where I mean because that that just seems like really hard because people are so ideologically right, anti-union in this country you know when when they don't like unions is everyone really hearing it's like a simile again sorry <laughs> <laughs> right um, sorry yeah no I'm just asking if people didn't hear about um, what it actually looks like to find a sort of anti-union leader and then try and get them take that role. So there's two, two huge different things in that one question. One is how do you find them, and then one is how do you persuade them. And they're really different. Um, uh, and the way you're going to find them uh, in our model, I actually have a, a really fun training called How to Identify the Organic Leader, but um, again, that would be way past our bedtime. Like. Uh, but so there really is a way to do it, is my point. Um, and the way to do it, I'll just give you an example, by way of an example, in a hospital on one shift, right? So I gave the example in the beginning, big mistake, young organizer, inexperienced organizer, you know, comes back to evening debrief. Uh, by the way, all we do is work when we're doing the campaign. So, you know, we have 9 a.m. brief, we have 9 p.m. debrief, 9 a.m. brief. So they have to come back in at the end of the day and tell me about every conversation they had with every worker that day, right? Did you get the card? Did you not? Did you succeed or not? Um, have the conversation go because we're teaching. That's the teaching part. And that's the same thing we do with the workers once we've identified the leaders. Have the conversation go, what worked, what didn't. Um, so. Uh, uh, most young organizers or inexperienced organizers um, think the person who runs to them first and says, like, wow, calls the office, we want the union, is the leader. Um, and that's why we lose. So how we do it. Uh, early on, um, someone is going to start getting us together. We're going to do house calls, or someone's going to get either house meetings, small group meetings with workers from the same shift. And we're going to try and isolate it by every shift, every department, every, because different people lead different people in every work site. Um, so uh, we say you haven't identified the organic leader on one shift in one department in one unit of any place until a conversation has been had with the majority of the workers and they all answer, or most of them answer, with the same one name. So that's how you know it. So there has to be one-on-one -on -one conversation with most workers on a single shift in a single department where the answer is Mary. Uh, and Mary could be, let's say, we would categorize her as a four. We have a number system, one, two, three, four. One is for the union. Two is sort of leaning that way, but not a leader. Three is really on the fence. We're not sure, but there are targets. Four is anti-union. So we might realize, uh, let's say, 30 workers, and 20 of them say to us, 
Uh, if we, here's the questions. An example of the questions you would ask of every worker to get to that answer. Um, who do you turn to when you don't know how to do something at work? My favorite question. Because that's going to be the trust building question. And it's going to be a good worker. And then you're going to say, uh, someone who's highly competent. And then you're going to say to them, um, would that person give you the time? Oh, yeah, well, the reason I'm going to turn to Mary is because she's really good at it. And even if she's really stressed out and she's got too many patients herself, she's actually going to stop and make the time to show me how to do the procedure. Uh, OK, high ethics. They all think Mary has high ethics. Because Mary has got enough patients herself, but she's going to stop and train you because you're the new nurse and you know what you're doing yet. And that's how much she loves patients that she's going to make sure you can do your job. So that's the second quality you're looking for is ethics and respect and morals. Um, then we're going to say, we're going to listen for stories. And someone's going to say, you know, on our shift, well, I don't really know. On our shift one day, though, they changed the schedule and they didn't tell anyone and no one knew about it. And someone got written up for it. And we'll say, well, who did everyone turn to to try and resolve the problem? And if the answer again is Mary, now you're starting to get a commonality. So you have to have the conversation with the majority of workers. Not all of them, but a majority. And the majority have to answer a series of questions that get you the concept of who's the most trusted worker in that shift in that unit. And the most trusted person is your leader. So that's step one. And that's the most, I think, important part of the job. And the most misunderstood. And I would argue why we're losing, again, in large numbers all over America. <laughs> Um, why unions are losing a lot. People aren't being trained in the skill of leader ID anymore. So I was trained in direct lineage from someone named Leon Davis, who was a New York organizer who started what became 1199 New York. And you can actually trace in America who's trained by who, just like I brought up the example earlier for a reason, that Cesar Chavez wasn't just a guy who became a leader. He was trained by Fred Ross Sr., right? No one knows Fred Ross's name. They all know Cesar Chavez's name. Well, who trained Cesar? Fred Ross Sr., right? So. I can literally tr plot for you like thousands of organizers trained by the same person that I was trained by originally, right? So you can do these maps of who trains who. And where there's very little training of organic leader ID happening in our movement in America right now. So the concept is very important. And then how you persuade them is a very different conversation. But the core idea is in those same one-on-ones that we're having initially to find out who the organic leader are, we're doing multiple things at once. We're finding out who the organic leaders are. We're having initial conversations with thousands of workers one-on-one, -on -one, privately at their house, usually away from work. Um, we're also finding out really early in the conversation what's pissing that worker off most at work. What's the most important issue to that worker? Because it, there's never a worker who has the same, it, workers have all different issues. Don't ever assume they have the same issues. Low pay, forget it. Most workers are fighting for dignity and respect at work, not pay or their health care plan. Or, right? So, but you have to know what the worker's issue is to hold them during the tough boss fight that's coming. Because what you have to be able to show, once you understand the issue that matters to each and every worker, to hold them in a tough fight when they're getting their butt kicked by their boss, that the only solution to get what their issue is, so if it's healthcare for you, and for you it's getting a daycare center, um, and for you it's the repressive witch who keeps changing your schedule and just wrecks your life so you can't get to pick up your kids after school. Three different issues, three workers, same shift. The point is that you have to be able as the organizer to explain that no way will any individual worker ever individually be able to change that situation. It's only going to happen through collective action. So you're moving a concept that in America is really challenging, of taking people from the idea that individuals can individually change things to the concept that they'll, not one of these workers will ever want a daycare center, a change in the health care plan, or a change in a third shift boss, unless they come together collectively. So it's teaching. That's the role about teaching collective, how collective power can change things. So if the four, if the anti-union leader says to me, well, I've already figured out uh, her issue. We've gotten her issue out of her. Because she'll talk. Most, most, they'll talk in your face. They'll be like, screw you. I hate you people. My mother was in the Steelworkers Union. They screwed her. Like, they'll talk to you. Ah, I got plenty of conversations with workers who hate the union initially. They'll give you all the opinions in the world about why, why we stink. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, but I'm going to get out of her, like, really, so uh, everything's going great for you today. It's all a Q&A. It's a conversation. So you got to be sassy right back, especially with the tough one. And be like, really? So I get it. You work in Shangri-La, huh? Not a single complaint at work? Because that's just bullshit. Even a pissed off anti-union worker has an issue. So you got to bait them until they get, you get the issue. If you don't get the issue, you're screwed. But anyway, this is really like a multi-day training. But the point is there's a science and a method to it, serious science and a serious method. And you got to get the issue. Because you got to come back in that, with that worker 50 times in 50 days or 50 times in 20 days and keep saying, 
so how are you going to get the child care center at work? D d does it work for you to go ask your boss individually, hey, boss, I'd like to have a child care center. Could you build one for us? Because the answer is going to be no. And even the anti-union worker initially who thinks they're anti-union at some point understands, how come I haven't been able to get a child care center even though we all want one? Huh. Because the boss is a capitalist cheap bastard. He's not going to build you one unless you come together. Right? So it's like there's an evolution to an organizing conversation. So something called organic leader ID, and then there's something called the organizing conversation. And that's part of the persuasion, is constantly coming back to what it is that matters most to them. And if you don't know what matters most to them in the campaign, you're toast. There's several things if you don't do right, you're just losing. So, yes. So where do, where, where oh. do you go from here? What do you do there? Who? Are you organizing? Oh, me? <laughs> me? <laughs> so boring. I'm just, I'm just hanging out. I, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, I do a lot of organizer training right now still. I'm still doing consulting work for several union locals who I like a lot um, and doing sort of just private consulting for them. So, but that's just like to help me pay the bills in grad school. So I'm trying to just, I'm trying to like open up a dialogue though in America about why things are going wrong and how we can change them. So one of the major differences between unions and especially other uh, progressive or community organizing groups is uh, the ability of unions to amass resources in a way that especially a lot of small organizing groups have never been able to do. Do you have any thoughts on that? And also I was interested in, as you're talking about this whole worker model and moving out of the workplace, does that change the due structure or the membership when you're thinking about changing the organizing relationship? Yeah, oh, you're also smart and interesting. See, um, <laughs> another good question. Um, y y yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, a uh, few things though. One, there's a lot of critique uh, when you're in the labor movement. A lot of trade unionists will say, well, nothing's real except us because we can build independent capital. We can, you know, mass resources. Um, and first I want to break that down for just a second and then I want to come back to the other part of the question. And if I forget it, you can remind me. Um, but I want to be really, really clear. Uh, I've uh, been in giant campaigns in the labor movement where we've already won, the union's won. So now we've established a union. Uh, and now we're on our second contract, say, right? Because you don't really get the union until you've actually bargained your first contract. You don't have to win the vote. You actually have to bargain your first contract. You have to start getting dues, and then you have a union under law. So if you vote yes, you don't have a union. But anyway, boss gets two times to whack you in the head before you have a union. So, then it's in the bargaining of your contract, third test, and you've got it in the contract negotiations, uh, you've got a win language that says the employer agrees to deduct your dues and forward them to the union. So even though there's this whole debate about, there's so much myth in America about union bosses and money. Um, so workers then have to vote to ratify a contract that says one of the articles that we're demanding in our contract is that our employer will deduct our dues. And how most workers win that, even in New York, Connecticut, even in union shop states, unlike the red rights work states, how you win that language most of the time is by compromising with the employer on language that's called no strike, no lockout. Because the employer wants the stability in the workplace and you're not allowed to do strike midstream at all. So unions surrender the right to strike for the life of the contract in exchange for getting that money. I'm also arguing in some other place in this dissertation, or maybe just in a series of articles, uh, one that's coming out soon, I take this out, um, that it's also a bunch of crap in some ways because you've made tremendous compromises um, to, have all those much, to have all that money coming in. Um, so in Nevada, when we were leading that first hospital strike, um, five hospital employers, uh, several months apart, shut off. We allowed the contracts to expire to get ready for a strike. And all my trainers, all my leaders my whole life were like, no one ever cuts off dues, you know, whatever, whatever, even though you, they can do that. And it was like five in a row. Uh, cut off due deduction the day the contract expired and were bankrupting us. Um, and the reason we survived is because we had a giant international solidarity fund and we were getting locals to give us money and right. But so, so on the idea that you know foundations can change the behavior of community groups, it's also true that bosses change the behavior of unions. <coughs> Same control over their money. Does that make sense, people? Like really important concept. They really, uh, if you if you accede to the most of the demands that most unions do on a contract. Um, you're either not amassing as much capital or you're um, making big compromises and changing the, maybe that's why no, that's why, maybe that's why no one goes out on public transportation, housing, and you know, issues outside of work, because you're going to upset the capitalist 
and the mayor next door, right? Um, so that's one part of the answer is that it's, it's, it's not just foundation funded groups, it's also unions. Um, and the second concept um, is that we didn't get to play, so we were forced in those facilities to go to an alternative hand dues collection, which was wild. Like there we are heading into a giant strike and we're literally like, uh, this would be a joke if you knew, what the boss says when you're doing an, an initial organizing campaign, the boss will say, one flyer will always say, the union wants a blank check, don't give them a blank check, you know, that's what mm -hmm. union dues are. And then literally we were out there running around having to collect blank checks from workers who were already in the union because the boss had kept their money and we were sending them revolving money to come out of there directly out of their checking accounts. They, were had, they had to give us voided checks. It was absolutely mind blowing if you were a new organizer. Like, we need a blank check. It's like, oh my God, how can we run this campaign? Um, so we set up a hand dues alternative system. Um, but we never got, or I haven't got to the point yet and have to have the pleasure to go out and tinker with the dues model in the broader community. Um, it usually involved like why I showed the picture with the mother's daughter, who was not a union member, she was in school, who had recruited her minister to come do the work to support the union and the union supporting the housing fight. And so we wound up having a lot more resources because the black churches were playing in that fight really heavily and putting in money and resources. Mm -hmm. But we didn't get to like, we didn't get in that, we haven't gotten yet, or I haven't gotten the pleasure and haven't seen yet, where people are playing with, is there associational dues that people in the community would pay or something like that. Um, I think they're doing that at one of the AFL-CIO, Working America, Working for America or something, but it's not really, there's no union attached to it yet, but it'd be nice to get to that concept. I think resources matter, to be clear. You can do a lot more when you have $10 million than you can when you have a dollar. Um, so you're, you've clearly done a lot of We're gonna stop in like several minutes. That's my first clue is that we're stopping. <laughs> thank you, thank you, very nice to you. Thank you. Thank you, um, have a nice night, UFC brother. Uh, but at nine we're stopping, yes. Okay. Um, so you've done a lot of really creative like thinking about how to And tactics, stuff. like the yes man, oh it's so important right. in there. Uh, yes, no, but you, like, make the boss look dumb. Your yes. tactics, like if, yes. I mean, figuring out how to organize people, it's like creative work and you clearly enjoy a, a fight. You really enjoy it, obviously. I enjoy winning. You enjoy winning. <laughs> and I enjoy losing winning. fights. Right, yes. right, of course. But is there like, so for young people who are creative and enjoy fighting, or enjoy the idea of winning a fight, right. um, is there like an anecdote that you often tell about like something you, you've gone through that would convince them that maybe they would want to try this and be organizers themselves? Like a particularly fun, well, there is. Um, I, I don't care if anyone buys the book I just wrote, but it's, it's filled with some of the funnest stories in my life. That's why they're in a book. But, um, uh, you know, I don't, what anecdote? I mean, yeah, I mean, look, the point is workers, I mean, uh, if there is 34 pages of workers kicking the boss's ass um, and raising expectations. And um, I would say there was the most epic fight that I was ever involved in was beating a guy named Brent Yesen. So let's just put his name out, especially for the cameras. Brent Yesen, um, who we expose in this book. Uh, he's a really mean, nasty son of a bitch union buster. So there's a whole cottage industry of union busters. That's all they do. They're professionals, right? They're the, they're the anti-us, right? They're high, except they're highly paid. You know, like they cost like 10000 a day. I think he charges employers to come in and bust the union. Um, and he's famous, this guy, Brent Yesen. And by the way, the place he was going to go next was the UK. So he did something already in the UK. I think he got beat once. But anyway, so this, I know, I've been tracking him because I'm like, you know, it's like I was possessed by him for a while because he was attacking us constantly. Um, so Brent Yesen is a notorious figure who beat, who, who literally crushed like a ton of unions, beat the California Nurse Association, beat, just beat a ton of, his specialty is nurses and uh, for a while was nurses. Um, and I, uh, one thing that the Verso Press cut out of the book, uh, we had a little, a lot of legal issues trying to get my book to uh, press because I'm telling real stories. So one that came out was what I actually called Brent Yesen in the beginning of the book, which was I said about him as a way of describing this union buster who's notorious all over the country, um, that he was uh, more apt or probably trained as or could have been the head of the secret rape division for the CIA in like Uganda. Like that's how vicious he was, right? Because we do have those divisions in the CIA. So that really is what he's like. Like he's sick in the head and he does psychological warfare to get workers to hate each other and fear each other and freak out in a little giant campaign. And he would play sexist, genderized, invite them out. I mean, I uh, can't even tell you. 
the story is what he was doing to nurses privately in rooms, one on one, and I was like a terrorist, so uh, hired for a lot of money. Um, and he, you know, I said, there's no short story, but basically, you know, over the course of three years in Nevada, um, we relent, uh, we just, we killed him. Like he came after, he kept coming after us and coming after us. That's what led us into the first strike. Like he was like, you're never signing a contract with these workers. It's never happening. They're never having a union. Never, 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 never. He had been firing people. Joan Wells, who's a tremendous, uh, one of my favorite nurse worker leaders ever, uh, was fired because of him. Um, uh, you know, and three years later, after a lot of fighting uh, and a lot of money, that's what happens money, so to go through the litigation um, and her tenacity uh, in the union, you know, we wound up getting her job back and she got 205000 in back pay out of it. It's a rare, rare victory for an individual worker, but really what the point is, she continued to lead her workers against Brent Yesen, um, even after she was fired. Um, and those workers went on to win and get a contract and win fully employer paid free health care and change their entire life and win self scheduling. And, you know, we took, we basically took in Vegas, we took a, a non union hospital market union in a very short period of time. And the kind of things that changed for workers were like literally they went from paying 400 a month for health care to it being 100% paid by the employer. Like that single act in a three year campaign for thousands of workers is like, when to me, there's nothing more inspiring than that. It's like they had huge raises, but like the fully dependent healthcare coverage, which no one in this country is winning. Uh, we took an entire market there by using militant, organizing, whole worker tactics. Um, you know, we organized seven hospitals in a row, uh, led the first strikes. You know, basically just bucked a lot of convention. And I was, you know, bas basically, I mean, it's the end of the story in the book, but. You know, I was basically threatened with being trusteed, and um, I was in a lot of trouble with the national leadership of the union at the time, who told us that we couldn't take workers out on strike because they had a private agreement with the employer that we wouldn't, and we did. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of complexities that happened later down the road. But, yeah, I mean, that. I mean, just like thousands of workers' lives were changed because suddenly all their children and their spouses won the right to free health care in a country that has very expensive health care in America. Um, you know, through just a couple of years of serious struggle. Uh, and it's life changing for a lot of them. Like people literally coming in crying, like watching workers crying during their contract ratification votes, uh, you know, it's sort of a, an incredible experience. Um, not easily replicated unless you just go out and do it. So, yeah. Anything else? What do you, what do you have to learn? One more. Like One more question, yeah. <laughs> what do you have to learn from right wing and like anti. Uh, anti-affirmative action movements and those kind of like organizing against what you do and what do you have to learn from their struggles, their fight? Um, a lot, I think, right now, because I think at the same time that we, that the progressive movement in America began to go more to the mobilizing model, the right wing began to go more to the organizing model. Yeah. Um, it's been really interesting. So when people say to me, the Tea Party is all bullshit, it's fake, it's corporate funded bullshit, I'm like, really? <laughs> That's, I think that's the craziest thing in the world to say. Because there are thousands of people out there who believe that they're part of the Tea Party. And yes, they might be getting money from Coke and whoever else and whoever else, but like to deny that there is a conservative movement that real people are attached to through their right-wing churches and conservative institutions all across the country, that is a denial of reality. So like step out of New York and go out, because <laughs> it's there. Right? Look at a gun rally, look at a... Um, so um, I think that what they do best uh, what the right does best uh, in this country is the use of fear. And by analogy, again, going back to a union campaign, what the employer does best is the use of fear, right? If you see the employer as a right-wing formation, it's like fear and division uh, is what they do really well. Um, and I think that, uh, so it's important to look at that. Um, and for me, the most important single concept is how we help people overcome fear. Because uh, fear is what holds us back from almost from claiming all that's right. If you think about the again going back to Occupy slogan, one percent versus the ninety nine. I ninety nine. I think ninety nine percent is a useful number in terms of the economic divide in this country, but I think it's a mistake when we say we are the ninety nine percent because ninety nine percent of us don't agree actually on the political economic structure of America. I think about eighty percent of us do. So I think in a real like where we could get to in America is like it's eighty percent versus. 20 or something in terms of the vision of should we have collective rights or individual rights? Should we have fully employer paid health care? Should we have free education? Should we have child care in America? Should we have 
you know, good things. I think 80% of Americans basically agree on what we should have. Um, do you agree or do, do. you convince them? Well, no, agree on the value, agree yeah. on what it is we want. Like if you, if you take ideology, political party, if you strip that out of a conversation with the average person and you say, you know, uh, yeah, eight, I think 80% agree on the ideas, like the core idea. And that, I'm taking that number from uh, 10 years of a lot of campaigns where we started with Republicans, Democrats, right wing. You know, I had a ton of guys pulling up to union meetings with gun racks and whatever. It's like, this is just America. It's like you're talking to workers hired by a boss. I'm like, I used to do some work with the electrical workers. I mean, you know, all of my, you know, most of my work was household workers, but not all of it. And it's like a trip. It's like plugging into Bakersfield, California, you know, to a meeting with a bunch of brothers. And it's like every single person's coming in with a giant truck and a gun rack and believes they're a Republican or starts that way. And we're not heading that way. And I can get into a meeting like that and stand up and start a conversation about, what the re what's really going wrong in their life, and in the course of a long conversation, they're going to actually have a different opinion about what's really going wrong in their life. So I think 80%. Um, we got to 80% membership in right-to-work states, meaning in states where no one had to, where they didn't have, what, what do they call it, the right one calls it compulsory union dues. You know, my last like five years was working in right-to-work states where the workers didn't have to join the union. And what we got to, what we could get to under a militant whole worker kind of organizing model, um, was 80% membership, sustaining an 80% membership base. So my theory is that about 80% of America agrees on some pretty cool concepts, like about that we should have a better society. And we're going to be fighting about 10%. 10% are just not going to agree ever. And there's 10% in the middle uh, that we probably don't even have to bother with because it's going to take so long to flip those, all those antis, you know what I mean? But I think with 80%, oh my God, we tear the country back down and start to rebuild it as a place where people have justice and people can look forward that maybe their kids can do better than them and all those basic concepts that we had in America for about 45 years that are just trashed right now, right? Poverty, income gap, uh, racism, uh, inequality, you know, every trend line in this country is in the wrong direction right now. Um, it's because we, we're lacking the discipline of a movement that reaches out in, I think, the ways that I was describing. Thank you all for being here.